Dankeschön. So. Uh, I would like to, to give a few uh, explicit computations. So, well, I should put some quotes around explicit, but because it won't be that explicit in fact. So it turns out to be quite difficult to, to completely compute slopes. So I will try to give two examples. In one example, it will be uh, com completely explicit, and we can really do something. And in the other, we have a formula, but uh, which is not that explicit, and in fact, not that easy to use, but gives some information. So let's start with the, well, the most obvious case. I mean, one case, in fact, which we have already seen, in some sense, so the case of the project, project space. All right, so uh, the proposition is as follows. So for So I'm cheating a little bit because I'm choosing a metric which is convenient for my computations. But the result is as follows. So let x be a point in the projective space. Then the freeness of x is equal to 1 over n plus 1 plus the minimum over the f, and I will be more precise in one moment about the f I'm considering, of n minus n times the degree of f divided by uh, the co-dimension of f uh, times the height of x, where uh, f goes over the subspaces of uh, k n plus 1. which are uh, different from k n plus 1, and such that x belongs to uh, the projective space associated to f. So OK, for me, uh, the projective space corresponds to lines, not to hyperplanes. Right, so uh, let me give a sketch of proof of that. Well, in some sense, it's, it's more or less a definition. But <laughs> let me say a few more words, and simply it follows from the definition. So first of all, let E, well, let e be uh, the vec vector space k n plus 1. And let D in E be the line corresponding to X. X. Then uh, there is a canonical way to describe the tangent space of the projective space at X, which is namely to say that it is, well, isomorphic to but in a canonical way, to uh, the dual of d tensorized by e over d tensor by its dual. 
All right, so, so that's a way to describe the fiber of the tunnel space at x. OK, and once you have that, you see that the degree, well, uh, sorry. So you get, a, a, OK, so I have to get back the eraser. So once you have seen that, you get that. You get that there is a one-to-one -one map between the subspaces uh, F, which contains D, and the subspaces of the tangent space at x, which simply maps some subspace f to d tensorize, d dual tensorized by f over d dual tensorized by d. And then uh, you can look at the degree of that. So what is the degree of that? of this quotient. Well, of course, you have to know that, in fact, this is isomorphic to k. And therefore, you get that this is the same as the degree of d tensorized by f minus the degree of k. And uh, therefore, you get that it is equal by the formula we have seen during the first week to the degree of f uh, minus the dimension of f times the degree of d minus the degree of k. And now, if you do the same for uh, the tangent space, you see that the height of x in that setting is given by minus n plus 1 the degree of d uh, minus the degree of k. So if you look at the slopes now, so you are, in fact, interested at the, in the minimal slope. So the minimal slope for uh, the tangent space is going to be, uh, so uh, if you do the computation, so um, <coughs> I uh, should do uh, this minus this divided by the uh, co-dimension. So this gives me something which should be minus the degree of d, because here I have minus n plus 1 uh, plus the dimension of f. So this is a co-dimension of f. All right. So minus, and I have to divide by the co-dimension afterwards. So this gives a uh, degree of d plus the minimum of minus. So uh, of course, in the definition, a priori, it is, uh, well, no. Let me write it like that. Minus the degree of f divided by the codimension. Oops, sorry, I'm going. Sorry, I'm making a mess of it. Yeah. Minus the degree of f divided by the co-dimension of f. And the degree of k 
k disappears because I mean we have it on the both on both sides. So okay, I should have said what I do is the difference h of x minus that, and then I divide by the co-dimension of f. So in that way, I get this. All right, and then you have to remember that the freeness of the point x is equal to n times the minimal slope divided by the height. And OK, and the height is here. So uh, you get, uh, well, oh. OK, I forgot about this, so I have to correct that. Uh, I forgot about this degree of k. OK, so, OK, so. I forgot about the degree of k in the denominator. All right. Anyway, the point is that if you look at this formula, you have to realize that, in fact, this is positive. Because, in fact, the degree, the Arakulov degree of f is negative. So uh, forgetting about this uh, error term, we get that well, it's bigger than n over n plus 1 plus something which is bounded by 1 over h of x. Right. Um, so now, <clears throat> so this says that if we, you are looking at Pn, the freeness is a strictly positive number. So this is, in some sense, uh, quite unusual. The point is that <coughs> uh, even if you look at homogeneous uh, varieties, the freeness can be quite small. So let me explain the second example. So uh, second example is P1 of k at the power n. So in, for this case, uh, the formula is very easy to obtain. Namely, we get that if we take a point x, which is x1, xn in p1 of k at the power n, then the freeness of x will be equal to uh, the minimum of the h01 of xi divided, well, n times that, divided by the sum for i going from 1 to n of h01 of xi. So it is the minimum of the heights of the various uh, components divided by the mean of the heights of the components. So the proof of that is extremely easy. In that case, in fact, it is, the point is that uh, the tangent space at x is simply the direction 
for r going from 1 to n of the tangent space at xi of p1. So this means that, in fact, everything decomposes in, in that direct sum. And uh, therefore, that you get that if you choose, well, choose sigma in Sn such that h x sigma 1 is larger than x the height of x sigma 2 and so on until the height of x sigma n. Then you get simply, I mean, the point is that, of course, uh, I'm going a little bit fast. But the point is that in that decomposition, if you look at, that, at the subspaces corresponding to the and now the harder Narasimhan filtration, they are given as direct sum in there. So you get precisely that the slopes mu i of x underline is nothing else than h of x sigma i. So this gives you at least this formula. So as a corollary of that, um, yeah, maybe in the case of the property space, uh, oh, I forgot to say that. Mm. Yeah, in the product space, you can prove uh, the following uh, result. You can prove, in fact, that uh, if you look at the uh, set of points in the projective space such that the freeness of x is strictly less than 1 minus epsilon. And you divide it by, uh, sorry, on the height of x is less than b. And you divide it by the cardinal of p n of k with height less than b, then it is possible to show that this goes to 0 as b goes to infinity. So in some sense, you could say that uh, most, I mean, most of the points, well, I don't know how to, well, in some sense, uh, the freeness of a point in the projective space goes to 1, in some sense. But you should have to be careful, because on the projective space, if you fix some hyperplane, so let h be a fixed hyperplane in Pn of k. And if you look at uh, mm, all right. Yeah, if you look yes, uh, you look at the point at the freeness of the point which are in H and you look at the limit when, so x belongs to H, 
and uh, the height of x goes to infinity. So, okay, there are two h, which is rather stupid of me. So, let f be the hyperplane. So I fix uh, uh, some hyperplane in the projective space, and I look at the points in uh, the hyperplane on, as the height goes to infinity. And then, in fact, this goes to n over n plus 1. Because if you look at the formula here, the point is that if you fix some f, then uh, here you get something the height of x goes to infinity, so the quotient here goes to 0. So the sum goes to n over n plus 1. So if you fix some hyperplane, and you look only at points which are in that fixed hyperplane, then somehow the freeness of the point goes to the minimum, to the possible minimum. But if you look at random points in the projective space without limiting it to be to some fixed hyperplane, then in fact, the proportion of points with a height less than 1 minus epsilon goes to 0. So of course, here epsilon is strictly positive. Right. OK, so now let's turn back to p1 at the power n. Uh, there you see the situation is radically different because to say that the uh, freeness is small is to say that one of the component, one of the component of the point uh, has a small height. So order of the result about the computation of the freeness in uh, P1 at the power n is that if you look at the number of points in P1 of k at the power n, such that the freeness of x is less than epsilon, uh, epsilon, and the height of x is less than b. And you divide that by uh, the cardinal of the points in P1 of k at the power n with height less than b. Then when b is going to infinity, this goes to some constant, which is, in fact, strictly positive. So there is a positive proportion of the points which have a freeness which is less than epsilon. But uh, c epsilon, so again, epsilon is strictly positive. c epsilon goes to 0 as epsilon goes to 0. And in fact, you can be more precise than that. So let me be slightly more precise. You can prove that C epsilon is bounded by a constant times epsilon. But still, I mean, the proportion of points with a small freeness on P1 at the power n is not negligible. So the situation between the projective space and P1 at the power n is radically different from this point of view. OK, so maybe I uh, will give a quick sketch of the proofs yes, uh, of this corollary. Well, to prove that, I mean, it's, it's based on the fact that we know the number of points which are uh, bonded height on P1. So the starting point is the fact that, well, OK, the number of x of points in P1 
P1 over K of height less than B is equal to uh, some constant which I do not want to describe. Let's say C of P1 of K times B times uh, something which is bounded by B at the power one half times logarithm of B. All right, and then what do we want to estimate? We have this, in fact, we can look at the various heights on P1 at the power n. We perhaps, so x1, xn, to the family H of X1, H of Xn. Is there any question? So H of X1, H of Xn. So um, and then if I want to find the height on P1 at the power n, simply I take the sum. So y1, yn goes to the sum for i going from 1 to n of the y i. So this is the height on p1 at the power n. So now using this formula on this uh, description, uh, using partial integration, It's not very difficult to show that if you look, well, of the number of points in P1, K at the point such that the height, the exponential height is less than B, well, this will be equivalent to the constant for P1 at the power n times uh, B times the volume of T1, Tn in Rn such that the sum for i going from 1 to n of the Ti is less uh, that logarithm of p. And I should take positive ti's. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And this is nothing else uh, than, and I've done something wrong, of course. Uh, I'm going too fast. No, this is wrong. This is totally wrong. Uh, mm -hmm, sorry? Sorry? What did you say? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, it's stupid of me, sorry. I should have been more careful. I think, okay. I should write it like that. Yeah. Sorry. So, so T1 in R plus at the point such that the sum of the Ti's is less than logarithm of B. And I think. Uh, I have to take something like um, ah. <laughs> uh, 
I wanted to skip some steps of the proof, and then, of course, I wrote something which was wrong. So let me do that in a better way, I hope. page <sighs> sorry about that yes that's it Sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's something like that. Okay, on these gives, okay. I know what I want to get in the end, so this is equivalent to B logarithm of B at the power of n minus 1 times the volume of the T1, Tn, Uh, such that the sum from i going to from one to n of the ti is less than one, which is uh, one over n minus one factorial, I think. Uh, no, n factorial. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then if you consider the other uh, thing, then in fact the, the thing you get is about the same. Except that you have added an extra condition, which is that uh, the uh, minimum of the HI of X has to be uh, less than uh, epsilon times um, h of x over n. So the sum of the h i. So uh, what you get in the end is that it is equivalent to the same constant for p1 at the power n times b times logarithm of b at the power n minus 1 times the volume of the T1, Tn in Rn, uh, Rn with positive uh, coordinates, such so as the sum of the Ti's is less than 1, but the minimum uh, 
of the TIs is less than epsilon over n times uh, the sum of the TIs. So if you look in dimension two, you see you get something like that. So you have you are counting like in there. And then you are imposing that you are in a small area here. On this volume, of course, is something which is less than a constant time times epsilon. But of course, it is something which is strictly positive. And this is where this constant C epsilon appears. And in fact, C epsilon is exactly given by the quotient of this volume by this volume. Right. OK. So I ma um, uh, I've made a, ma a mess of, uh, of this proof, but uh, OK. Fairly easy, but I did not prepare enough. Anyway, it's a good exercise. Uh, well, so, all right, so this gives two examples in which it is possible to compute this constant explicitly, and you see that. OK, most of the points have a freeness which is bigger than epsilon, except that, I mean, you still ha may have a small proportion of points with a freeness smaller than epsilon in cases like that. So now, why is it useful? So up to now, I, have, I did not make the connection between my problem, which was to understand accumulating subsets and the freeness. So it's time to do that. So let me first do it on surfaces. Well, on surfaces, uh, at least conjecturally, the accumulating subsets are given by rational numbers. So, in some sense, the following proposition answers the answers the question. So, let S be a nice surface over some number field, and let L be, in S, be an exceptional curve. So by this, I will mean uh, that it is <coughs> uh, a rational curve. Uh, in fact, isomorphic to P1. With a negative uh, self-intersection. So an example for that are the 27 lines on a cubic surface. Right, so... Then, if I look at the set of x in L over k, such that the freeness of x is strictly positive, this set is finite. So this means that if I impose on the points I'm, I'm counting that the freeness 
is uh, bigger than some epsilon, even a decreasing epsilon, as big goes to infinity, then I remove almost all points in the exceptional lines. Or in other words, I can say that uh, freeness detects uh, in an effective way the points which are on an exceptional curve on the surface. So the proof, well, I have already given last time the, the needed tool for the proof. So, uh, proof. So, by adjunction formula, we have that the degree of omega L uh, is equal to L the auto intersection of L with itself plus L omega s. So uh, uh, So this has to be negative. And uh, what am I saying? Oh, yes. On the, yeah, of course, this is a rational curve. So this is minus 2. Uh, I'm wrong. What did I do? It's so to totally wrong. OK. Sorry. Uh, what? <laughs> Sorry. Um, mm? Sorry? Oh, it's minus one, yeah. So, OK. Well, uh, let me think. Uh, yeah, of course. No, uh, that's all right. Sorry. So in fact, what I want is that I want the intersection with omega s minus 1. So this gives that it is 2 plus ll, which is negative. So this means that. is strictly less than 2. But this is enough for what I want, because then remember that this is the degree of uh, pullback of Ts if, well, if I consider phi to be the isomorphism from P1 to L. So in this way, and also since it is an immersion, uh, I will have that uh, T of P1 inject in phi star of Ts. And therefore, I get that the minimal slope, so if I decompose this into a sum of O of AI from 1 to 2, uh, with A1 bigger than A2, then I have that A1 plus A2 is less than 2, but uh, A1 is larger than 2. Therefore, A2 has to be strictly negative. And therefore, I get that the 
freeness of phi is negative. And as I explained last time, the freeness of phi of x goes to the freeness of phi as x, as the height of x goes to infinity. And therefore we win because uh, this is equal to 0. Well, in fact, I have something stronger, of course. Uh, the point is that here the minimal slope A2 is strictly negative. And if you look at the proof I gave yesterday of this, you realize that, in, in fact, this implies that you have something stronger than that. You get that the minimal slope of phi of x is negative outside the finite set. And this gives a proposition. OK, so uh, this explains the first example I gave. The first expo example I gave, uh, remember, was the plane blown up in a point. So if you blow up a point in the, in the plane, the exception line you get uh, is exactly of that type. So now let's turn to the vibration. So why am I looking at vibrations? So remember the counterexample of battery from Schinkel. The, the way they constructed the counterexample is to look at a vibration in which uh, the rank of the Picard group jumps in the fibers. And therefore, you get infinitely many fibers with uh, too many points. So what can we say in the case of vibration? So Position. So uh, let phi from x to y be a morphism, dominant morphism. Of nice varieties. Then there is exists a constant C, which is uh, strictly positive, such that for any x in x of k, such that uh, it's not critical. So it's not a critical point. So Tx of phi is surjective. Then we have that the minimal slope of x is bounded by the minimal slope of phi of x plus c. So of course, I'm not assuming anything about uh, the way the metrics are defined. So uh, since we can change the metrics, there is has to be some constant here. Right, but uh, you see, this means in particular if that if you stay in one fixed fiber, then the minimal, if phi of x is fixed, then this means that the minimal slope is bounded. So when the height goes to infinity, the freeness is going to zero. And in some sense, it is exactly what happens for P1 cross P1. I mean, if you stay in one particular fiber, the freeness goes to zero. So in some sense, it is a generalization of the computation I made for P1 at some power. 
Right, so what does it give so for the freeness? So for, for the freeness, it gives the following thing. So assume over that the height of x is strictly positive, then the freeness of x is less than, so uh, I forgot to, so this is of dimension n and this of dimension n. So will be less than m over n h of phi of x divided by. Sorry? Oh, you are asking tricky uh, questions. You get that? Actually, that's a very good question. Uh, because in my notes, it's not so clear as well. So, OK, thank you for this uh, very pertinent question. So L of phi of x plus some constant. Well, who cares? Uh, I have to be careful. M, N. So, uh, I want to have h over m, right? That's it. OK. That's the right coefficient. So anyway, this is slightly more precise than what I stated before. I mean, if I fixed phi of x, so I look at the points in one particular fiber, well, this implies, so this is fixed, this is fixed, and this goes to infinity in the fiber, and you get that the freeness goes to 0. So I'm not going to give the details of the proof because I do not want to finish late, since some of you have to leave. So um, let me uh, nevertheless uh, give some sketch of the proof. So the point is that, of course, you have this map Tx of phi, which goes from Tx of x to T phi of x of y. So if you take the dual, this gives some map. So this is supposed to be surjective. And therefore, if you take the dual, you get an injective map from t phi of x of y in dual into t x of x dual. So the spirit of that is that if you have a very short vector here, you get a very short vector here. So, and this is exactly uh, the kind, the, the thing which gives a slope. Remember that uh, uh, the first slope is directly related to short vectors. I mean, the, the, the maximal slope, and there is an inequality between the uh, maximal slope and the length of the shortest vector in the lattice, I mean, in the uh, usual setting. OK, so let me say it again. So if you have a short vector here, well, you have also a short vector here. So that's the, the spirit of the proof. So uh, yes, so this implies, if I, m I am more precise, we, you get that mu 1 of t e phi of x y. So each time this, I'm afraid of being mixed up in the signs, is less than mu 1 t x of x dual plus the maximum from 1 going from k going from 1 to the dimension of y to the logarithm of the norm of lambda k of tx of phi dual over k. So to get this, you look at all the subspaces of dimension k. You take a subspace of dimension k, then you have this map lambda k 
which goes from the subspace contained in there to the subspace to its image in there. And therefore, the degrees are related to this uh, logarithm of the norm. Anyway, so the point is that you have to remember that uh, the map phi is, uh, is a morphism. So in fact, all these terms, I mean, when you go uh, over all the points of the variety, this is bonded from above. So, so if you get that this will be less than some constant. OK, so this gives that there is a relation be between this slope and this slope. And then you use the formula, the duality formula for slopes. And you get that the minimal slope for x is bonded by the minimal slope for phi of x plus some constant. So let me state the color. I, I said it already, but let me write it now as a corollary, corollary of that. Well, you get that for a given y in y of k, which is not a critical value, let's say. Well, in fact, it's possible to improve this result, but which is not a critical value. So the, this means that t x of phi is subjective on the fiber, then you have that the freeness of x goes to 0 as x, as the height of x goes to infinity for x in the fiber. So again, if you look for a given fiber, if you look at the point in x, uh, in the fiber, such that the freeness of x is bigger than epsilon, then this is finite. Or more or less, more precisely, it is contained in the set of points in the fiber such that the height of x is less than some constant a. So once again, remember that the problem for the counterexample of battery reference chemical is that there were too many points in some fibers. But if you consider only points with uh, a freeness which is bonded from below, then this means that in each fiber you take only a finite number of points. So you don't have uh, this problem which was coming from the counter example of uh, battery reference schinkel. Right? So again, to say it more uh, precisely, I mean, at least again, you have that the freeness detects this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, accumulating subset. So uh, of course you can. There is a drawback about that. The drawback is that it works the same for any fiber, not only the bad fibers with the rank of the Picard group which is too big, but also for the fibers with a small rank of the Picard group. So you can seek of this as a drawback. I mean, you can say, well, it removes too much. I mean, it, it is indeed a question whether imposing, for example, that the freeness is bigger than epsilon may remove too many points. 
Et là, tu as 5, tu as too many points are bad. That's quite possible. But still, I mean, in some sense, it, it makes sense in each fiber to consider only a finite number of points in each fiber. You want something which, is, which moves around. And you do not want to stay in one particular fiber. So OK, I'm waving hands. So, okay. I will uh, give one more uh, argument in, in the 30 minutes I have for which to explain for which reason. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, reasonable. Yeah, uh, I have one hour and a half. So <laughs> I will explain for which reason is this quite reasonable to say that in some sense, if you stay in one fiber, uh, well, you get bad points as well. I will go back to that in a few seconds. So oh, let me state. Uh, some open questions about that. Or at least one open question. So the general problem I have is how to find a lower bound for uh, the smaller slope. So this is a very vague term. So let me give you a particular example, which is very frustrating for me. For example, there is an open question. Take d bigger than 3 and v in Pn, some hypersurface, smooth hypersurface, of degree d. And take the number of variables uh, as big as you wish let's say, at least big enough to satisfy the condition for the Birch theorem. Prove that, or disprove, maybe, prove that the number of points in V of k such that the freeness, well, the height of x is less than b, and the freeness of x is less than epsilon, this is negligible. So it should be. I mean, we know that there is a redistribution for, for uh, this kind of hypersurface because we have virtual. theorem. So the points are equidistributed. But I'm not able to prove that the freeness, I mean, I mean that this set of points with small freeness is negligible. I know how to do it for quadrics. For quadrics, it's OK. But uh, in higher degree, I don't know how to prove it. And I don't even know whether it is true, in fact, because I'm not able to prove it. So maybe it could be false. So the spirit of it is, OK, more precisely, what does it mean? So this is very concrete. You see, you have this equation, f, in uh, z of x naught xn with degree of f, f homogeneous of degree d. And you have that uh, tx of f, well, sorry, differential of x at of f equals 0 so implies x equal to 0. And, uh, well, you want to understand the 
the lettuce, which is in the kernel of uh, the differential wolf wave. So, in some sense, is to know whether this subspace, this hyperplane, is random enough. Because if it is random enough, then everything is OK. But I have no idea, really no idea. Yeah, I mean, the point is that if you look, uh, yeah, you can look at the, at the geometric setting. If you look at the geometric setting, then in fact, it's much easier to understand uh, what happens for uh, values of the minimal slope. Because in fact, you can describe it algebraically in some sense. So you have a much better control. I agree. OK, so this is the, the main open question for me uh, at the moment. Uh, right. OK, so uh, the last thing I want to speak about is about uh, the connection. So, in some sense, uh, I have the f well. I have proven in some case that when you have accumulation in uh, in a variety, then the corresponding points have a small freeness. So, uh, yesterday in uh, Ji Zhong Hong talk, we have seen that. Uh, there is also phenomena which are local accumulation. So let me say a few words about local accumula accumulation. So uh, the basic idea for local ac accumulation is the following. So. Uh, So uh, in very vague term, I mean, the point is that instead of looking of the proportion of points in a fixed open subset, you will look at subspace, open subspace, which depend on B, with size uh, going to 0 as B goes to infinity. So in other words, uh, the question, in very general term, is when have something like so you have some set U B, and you intersect it with a set of points of height less than B. You divide it by the total number of uh, the points of height less than B. So let's take in, in uh, some open subset. So OK, so uh, let me start again. So assume that there is an open subset U on which the points are equidistributed, right? And then you now look at the number of points not in a fixed sub, sub, uh, subset, but in W, which depends on B. And the question is, is that equivalent, as B goes to infinity, to the volume of WB, where WB 
is contained. Uh, Adelic space. So of course, I mean, you can choose uh, very easily uh, things for, for which, I mean, uh, families of WB for which this uh, is obviously wrong. So let me give you a more explicit example. So let me do it as follows. So this was explained yesterday. So one of the basic examples you want to consider is zooming around a rational point. So in some sense, it is related to find approximations of a given point. Okay. So you fix P0 in, well, assume k is equal to q and fix an, a given point, and then uh, fix as well a local diffeomorphism from uh, V of R to T, the tangent space at P0 of V over R, uh, local diffeomorphism. So to be more precise, will be defined on some open subset W in V of R, and it maps P0 to 0. Then you want to consider the following measure. So you are zooming, uh, on, zooming in on P0. So this gives the following kind of measure. So there are three parameters. So B is a real number. Well, this one is fixed. And alpha is fixed as well. Uh, yeah. So you are looking at 1 over the cardinal of P in U of Q of height less than b, such that rho of p belongs to some ball around 0 on radius r, b at the power alpha, uh, minus alpha. OK? And I take the sum over all points uh, like that. height of p less than b, and uh, rho of p belongs to this ball. Of the Dirac measure at b at the power alpha p. So this is a measure on the ball centered at 0 with radius r. OK, so you are zooming with the factor b at the power alpha. OK, then if uh, you take that for alpha equals 0, as you zooming that on u, the points are equidistributed for alpha equals to 0, this gives nu v restricted to the ball, well, the, I should say the probability measure induced by nu v, or rather mu infinity, on the ball. Uh, using the diffeomorphism row. OK. Then, of course, then you want the spirit of that. So in some sense, this is given by uh, something with a dis density. I mean, it is a measure with a density. So then you start to zoom in. So the spirit of that is that 
alpha, what you should get, I mean, if you zoom on something which is given by a uniform measure, you zoom in, then you simply get something which is uh, equidistributed for a Lebesgue measure. For very small alpha, I mean, you are not zooming too much, so it, st it stays equidistributed. But then, uh, if, well, there is a general principle is that when you try to approximate a rational point by other rational points, in general, there is a hole. I mean, you cannot approximate so well a rational point by other rational points. It's general principle. So, I mean, if you zoom too much, so if you take a big alpha, then uh, this is not, this is not, well, well, it is the measure, the direct measure at peanut, because the only point you find is the point peanut itself. And in between, well, you are inter interesting. This means that some, for some particular values of alpha, some particular values of, of the zoom, you will have interesting, interesting measures. Where, I mean, of course, the behavior of brusque b can change at some particular values of alpha. Yes? You could start from a rational viewpoint. So, uh, yeah, in fact, you can do that for not only around a rational point, but other, around other points. So, in fact, uh, my idea was to start with something simple, like a rational point, huh? but as we have seen in the talk yesterday, even around a rational point, it's not that simple. So, in particular, uh, what you can get over some over uh, even a simple example like P1 times P1. Well, even for that simple example, you get that for alpha in an interval uh, and uh, I forgot what interval it is. Well, some interval. This measure d r b alpha converges to something which is supported. So the limit, this converge, but to something which is supported by The horizontal line through P0 union the vertical line. So in fact, when you zoom in, almost all the points are on the vertical line or on the horizontal line. And in fact, for some values of alpha, you have that, in fact, the only points you get are the ones on the horizontal line and on the vertical line. Right, so this is a picture which Ji Zhong Hong draw, has drawn yesterday. Okay, I'm not able to draw it, so let me try to show you it to you. Uh, I hope I have it somewhere here.
Okay. Ah. Yeah, I have to. Yeah. Okay. So this is P2. So P2 is a zoom. So you see, instead of looking at x and y less than 1, I take small values of x, small values of y, and big, a bigger value, and a bigger upper bound for, so for the height. And uh, the point is that, in fact, in that case, you can prove that uh, the picture stabilizes quite quickly. And in fact, the measure at the limit is precisely supported, well, you have to take the right alpha for that. I mean, it's one particular value of alpha for which you get this picture which stabilizes. And in fact, the measure is supported by all the lines going through the point. So the measure you get is a sum over all the lines going through the point of a measure which is supported on each line. And on, yes? Rational lines, thank you. All rational lines. And uh, on each line, I mean, you can give a precise description of the measure on each line as well. Uh, so in fact, uh, the point is that since I'm cutting here the picture on the square, in fact, there is only a finite number of lines which appear. Because, I mean, if you want to have more lines, you have to do a bigger picture. Okay, so this is P2. Then uh, I hope this is P1, of course P1. So uh, this picture I made uh, at the zoom which stabilizes this drawing here. But this means that in fact the distance here is going to zero. So you get that in fact most of the points are on the horizontal line on the vertical line. Okay? And also you have this nice picture with hyperboles which appear around the point. So in fact, it's possible in that case, so it was due to, to page law, but it was never published uh, by page law. So the measure you get is that it's something like uh, beta of xy divided by xy square dx dy, where beta of t is a sum for n less than t of uh, the cardinal of then z, z over uh, nz star. So, I mean, uh, you see that the jump you get is R for this hyperbola. So this is a precisely, so this corresponds to xy is equal to 1, xy is equal to 2, and so on. So this is a picture for P1 cross P1. So, uh, of course, the point is that if you look at the freeness of the point, the freeness on these two lines around these points are very small. But the freeness of the points here are quite big. Right, uh, I still have one picture. OK, so this is on the sphere. So again, you have a, something which is totally explicit in that case with uh, a measure which is organized in circle. So it is, in fact, the limit measure is invariant under rotation. And I think, uh, yeah, the measure you get is something like, um, a beta, prime of x squared plus y squared over x squared plus y squared, I think, dx dy, where beta prime 
of x squared plus y squared is equal to, well, I'm not going to be totally correct, but something like uh, a in z of i, such that the norm of a is less than t. The cardinal of z over z of, z over i over a star. So it is something like that. So it's very similar, but in fact, of course, we are considering we are in looking at the field q of i. All right. On the, as the last picture, so you can't see anything, right? So you still can't see anything. You can see something. OK, I can't do better. So if it is a test whether you have a good view or not. Uh, yeah, you, you, you still see something. So in fact, it is, uh, again, p1 cross p1. And there are, in fact, on this picture, blue points you almost not see, and red points that you should be able to see. So in fact, the color of the points correspond to the freeness. So red means a small freeness, and blue means a, a big freeness. Well, by this I mean near to one. So you see, this is in some sense the same picture for than the one p1 times p1 zoom. So you see, this point here is in fact blue. It's not obvious because it has a rather big freeness. But on the horizontal and vertical line, this is red, because in fact, all these points have a very small height. I mean, in fact, have height zero. The, for the first height is zero, or the second height, logarithmic height is zero. So in fact, on these lines, the freeness is very small. But here, in fact, if you can manage to see some points, there are some blue points here, and it is blue. Well, OK. So let me stop.